아, 네. 안녕하십니까. 오늘도 이른 아침에 이렇게 많이 나와주셔서 제가 감사합니다. 새해도 복 많이 받으시고 건강하시길 바랍니다. 그러면 현재상 <웃음> 제가 영어로 우리를 진행하도록 하겠습니다. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by wishing you a very happy new year. It has become our tradition to launch a New Year's forum with Dr. Allen Sinai, who usually covers the U.S. and global economic and financial landscape for the coming year. This year, too, we have Dr. Allen Sinai with us. He just flew in from New York last night for this event, and he's on his way to Japan to consult with the uh, uh, Japanese government and Bank of Japan. Uh, since uh, Dr. Sinai has been with us uh, many times before, I don't think I will waste a long time to tell you about him <coughs> in detail. But as you know, he is currently running <coughs> a firm called Decision Economics in the United States. And he is still leading global economic and national forecaster and strategist who is most sought after consultant for not only the U.S leading global firms and U.S. firms, but U.S. administration and the Federal Reserve. I know that he used to consult very closely with the Alan Greenspan when he was there, but now I suppose he does the same for uh, Mr. Bernanke. Uh, he also <coughs> uh, frequently consult White House staff and including the uh, uh, Vice President Kyle Virginia and others. Uh, I'm sure that you remember what he has said last year and the year before. Uh, uh, based on my <coughs> the uh, reading, uh, he has been consistently most accurate in telling us the coming years uh, economic and financial uh, the, the uh, landscape for the world and the United States. And uh, this morning again, I'm sure he will enlighten us on how the global financial and uh, economic uh, picture will look like. <coughs> and particularly uh, <coughs> he will tell us the U.S. economy which is very critical uh, for the rest of the world, of course, for, for me. So with this very short introduction, please welcome, please uh, join in welcoming us. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, let me uh, thank, of course, sponsors of this event uh, for uh, having me come to see, talk to you once again uh, this early in the new year and this early in the morning. And I want to thank all of you for coming to hear my remarks uh, this morning. I uh, wanted to talk to you today about not just the uh, prospects for the uh, U.S. and global economy and financial markets for uh, 2007, but to also bring a little uh, global perspective in terms of what I call seismic shifts, some very major changes, longer run, secular shifts and themes uh, in the global U.S. economy that are occurring uh, within which the context of the 2007 and 2008 outlook for economies and markets that will occur. Uh, these shifts include 
And we have, we have a number of them. We have at least 10 seismic shifts that we have identified. Seismic, as you know, is a word that sometimes refers to the earth, shifting earth. The earthquake major shifts in the landscape. Seismic shifts apply to the U.S. global economies and uh, in some instances to societal changes that are going on of that nature longer run what we observe not necessarily uh, events or processes that each day uh, are noticeable but over time uh, the shifts that are making for how economies and markets will behave and one of them is what has come to be called the new economic geography, changing economic geography. It refers to the emerging importance and greater role and influence of countries and groups of countries that previously were not in the center of the stage of global economic activity. Indeed, one theme for 2007, and a theme last year when I spoke to you, was how the U.S. economy was going to slow down in its growth, but the non-U.S. economies, collectively, the global economy, was going to speed up. We saw that happen in 2006, and think that in 2007, the shift in the pace of growth as between the United States, Asia, the Eurozone, the emerging, so-called emerging world, the relative growth rates across those regions uh, will uh, maintain their, their shift in speed. Part of it is the changing economic geography, the emergence and presence of rapidly growing Economies of countries like China, India, groups of countries such as emerging Europe, the former Soviet Union and Eastern European countries, countries in Latin America, the emerging world, the so-called developing world, now that's so much a part of the global economy and influence seen in a greater way than before how the global economy will behave. Changing economic geography. But one example, and an obvious one, is China. Now, on our measures, the fourth largest economy in the world. India, growing rapidly, 8 to 9 percent GDP growth a year. That's been going on now for several years, increasing in its role and importance in the world economy. And a whole range of countries, you mentioned Vietnam, uh, Asian countries, Previously, not forces nor even having emerged in the economic scene, which now are actively growing, and in many cases uh, growing more talked about today. Or personally, in our vacation, my wife and myself, I went to Chile and Argentina, and it's uh, quite a long way away from here. Uh, came back just uh, a little over uh, a week ago, and we spent time in Patagonia, the southern part of Chile, all the way to the Straits of Magellan, and parts of Argentina, and also Buenos Aires. But in the outlying areas that we saw in Chile and Argentina, it is striking to see how modern and uh, up-to-date, tourist-friendly are the relatively small towns in Patagonia, which see so many tourists, but also are very active in fishing and agriculture. The Chile and Argentina's growth rates are very strong. Sign of when there is tremendous prosperity. Now, perhaps not to you, but to me, when I come to Seoul, and each year look in a very superficial, quick way at how it appears, I'm sure you would, would not agree. Four and a half, five percent growth is, is an even by South Korean historical standards. But it feels good. It's all we've here. 
when I go to Tokyo. So it again feels good in Tokyo, and those of you who've been to China know how active China is, and of course so is India. It is striking to see around the world in areas and regions that five or eight years ago were not really part of the global economy, nor active, nor even modern, to see what has happened. It's a major force. And when I talk about change in economic geography, uh, that is part of it. But with economic growth, increased wealth, both political influence and power. And so, when looking around the world, it seems to me an immutable force, as long as we do not have major external shocks or wars or terrorism all over the world, will set things. Uh, it seems immutable that the relative influence and power of regions around the world is and will change immensely. And three or four years from now, when we look back, uh, it will be very different. Very different. Uh, a second seismic shift is one that's been going on for a while. It's called globalization. In part, it is a source of the changing economic geography. That it is more countries in the world economy participating, more spending by more uh, population to more countries, more investments, more opportunities for investors around the world, more production of various goods and services. In the case of goods, more countries producing the kinds of goods businesses in South Korea have produced over the years, much more competition problem on the trade side for South Korea. But for countries like Vietnam, China, or the emerging countries that are entering the global arena and producing agriculture, producing basic commodities, and selling into the world economy, it's part of the Indeed, globalization also means pools of labor, pools of capital, able to move quickly around the world for opportunities. In the United States, we see globalization in quite an intense way through the outsourcing of so many uh, labor work to India, the outsourcing of production by companies, U.S. based companies all over the world. That has been part of the agency, the outsourcing of production for various parts of the uh, Asian world for many, many years. Uh, this part of globalization lowers costs. Technology allows companies to build and buy and transport components of production from where they are produced in one part of the world to another part of the world where they at very low cost, then assembled and distributed and sold all over the world and sent all over the world. So products from Patagonia, where we work, can be sold here in Seoul, Korea in winter. And with some of them, we measured products because it was very, very cold. We, we saw some glaciers. Uh, it is just uh, so uh, striking to see this. That's modern technology, telecommunications, uh, uh, the internet, the ability to see what part of the world is going on and what might be bought in another part of the world. And finance and the portability of the finance, much more developed, ample finance for options anywhere in the world. So that there's a real estate recession in the United States. Investor money that they're going into real estate goes somewhere else in the world where there are opportunities and unexploited attempts or chances to get high returns in real estate in some part of the world here to that uh, helped with the transfer of capital. And of course, it's not that hardy days for a small resource town in southern Chile to build roads from one another. To bring in the infrastructure again assembled from not just companies in America but coming all over the world to very quickly replicate that wouldn't see in a rich country in Asia or for countries in what we call Eastern Europe now we call it emerging Europe to do the same but plus show time as a seismic shift has been ongoing for some years uh, a major continuing seismic shift changing how economies act, behave, and perform 
in the here and now and for the future. Two or three other shifts that I mentioned. One is uh, one that I mentioned last year, inflation. Quite not in much of the uh, world economy, in part because of recent fines of crude oil energy costs. Certainly quiet in the U.S. on the well-watched core inflation index these last few months. But for us, in our view of the U.S. and global economies and the active nature of the sustained expansion globally that we find ourselves in, that our sensitivity inflation on average rising around the world remains quite high. But it's not just a cyclical upturn and a decline of inflation rates in the U.S. or other countries that we are dealing with. We think, uh, we do think it's secular. Uh, of course, recently my prices have tumbled after gold and the slowdown in the United States, particularly in the housing and residential construction area, there are a lot of copper block and used. Probably a motivating force with a lot of copper prices and those countries who are copper exporters, the stock markets for them being hurt. But the long-run trends for all commodities and commodity prices in kind of interrelated global uh, economies that we see with interest rates relatively low in nominal in real terms and huge pools of funds the availability of credit quite ample and global suggests to us that inflation on average will continue to rise and as an investment theme uh, it is important and important in terms of prices of assets and asset classes including commodities positive force for some time for stock markets and ultimately for central banks around the world uh, a significant problem not this year but later on inflation in a secular upturn oh and we have to live with another seismic shift major change in the world backdrop that's geopolitical risks terrorism uh, the threat of outbreaks and confrontations and terrorist events almost anywhere in the world at any time and the cost and the infrastructure that has to be developed to deal with it. In the case of the United States, a preoccupation still with the war on terror, with the situation in the Middle East and uh, around the world and other troubled spots. Uh, security type and going on at all times uh, in order to prevent small risk of a very bad event, terrorism happening. And uh, two more seismic shifts to mention for you. Uh, one is global, it's aging populations. That's true in uh, Japan, South Korea, the United States. But longer lifetimes, more of the population in older age groups. The need for society to support uh, aging individuals as they retire, uh, the need for pension fund reform in many countries, and certainly health care and health care costs uh, as a major issue for countries around the world and potential drain on uh, government budgets in order to provide support. As a corollary, the tremendous technological change and innovation that goes on in healthcare, healthcare services, particularly on the product side. And somewhere, someday, hopefully a rationalization in our country in the United States of the provision of healthcare services in a cost-effective way so as to prevent a complete drain on the uh, federal budget deficit, uh, which uh, continues to loom for the United States in the future. The last one I want to mention before I turn to more mundane uh, things such as uh, relative growth and interest rates and central banks, uh, obviously political. In the United States, we had recently a major election, congressional elections, the off year elections. Uh, they, I think, uh, were quite significant. Uh, as you know, a complete sweep of Congress by the Democrats, a uh, strong for the time being repudiation of the international policies of President Bush and the administration by the body politic. Uh, quite a, a strong message of discontent sent by the American people 
in the off presidential year congressional elections, which from time to time happens. I think the last time we saw so strong a, uh, a voice shown by Americans uh, in the off elections was 1994, when Republicans were swept to power. Uh, and before then, it was in uh, 1980, the election of uh, President Reagan in the aftermath of the Carter years, I think now viewed by historians as a failed presidency, current presidency of 1976 to 1980 as a failed presidency. But in the United States, uh, to me, since I have been around for a long time, been involved as an advisor in politics, I've never publicly supported any candidate always been neutral, nonpartisan. Uh, a very significant election with a message of change uh, to Washington, a message of unhappiness with Washington, a message of disconnect between how Americans feel about the future uh, and how the U.S. economy is today. The U.S. economy is in excellent shape by all standard measures and conventional statistics. And yet, a whole range of polls show that Americans are uncomfortable. They don't feel good about things, and particularly the future. Uh, many of what I mentioned, the issues of retirement, health care, the budget, issues related to Iraq, the war, uh, the insecurity with regard to terrorism, the apparent inability of Washington to get much done, uh, questions about immigration, energy, Americans are very concerned. Now, the observation I would make on this potential seismic shift in American politics is that when we get the kind of election result that we saw a couple of months ago, that is a sure tip off that we're going to have an historic election for president in 2008 and we will have major shifts in policies coming out of the United States which will reverberate around the world. Perhaps the most significant one near term is trade and protectionism where in a democratic controlled Congress in the United States the sentiment Texas Senate is rising. It is particularly focused on China, much less so this time on Japan, certainly not on South Korea, uh, so that how that plays out and what that means for economies and markets that remains to be seen. But it's one of the political issues in the United States highlighted by the uh, resounding uh, message of the American voters to Washington that we're unhappy, we're unhappy about the future, uh, it's time to do something about it. Well, for economies in the world, in the U.S. and global economies, 2007 is shaping up in a very positive way as we see it. Uh, we are expecting to see the global and U.S. economies sustain the solid expansion that now exists. We are expecting to see the slow growth in the United States that was launched and began in 2006 continue. And the stronger growth on average outside the United States continue. In part, this is welcome because it is one step in the rebalancing of global imbalances that are so pronounced around the world. For years, the United States has been growing much faster than Japan and the Eurozone and the UK fed by American consumers spending quite aggressively and financed by countries 
lending and investing in the U.S. who are growing more slowly and saving more than the United States. The shift in relative growth that began last year, slowing down in the United States and speeding up the growth of other regions around the world, is the beginning, probably, of a long, slow process. Not generated on purpose by any major policy shifts in countries around the world, but just happening as the natural force of the global economic system. Slow growth in the United States, still very fast and strong growth in the Asian region, faster growth in the Eurozone, strong growth in the UK, and in the emerging world, strong if not dynamic growth in most of the emerging countries, developing countries of the world. But for the United States, uh, the economy slowed down quite significantly starting in the second quarter of 2006, extending well into the fourth quarter. And now uh, the economy is picking up some. The U.S. economy is picking up some. We think the U.S. economy is escaping a recession. A recession might result and will grow at a reasonably solid rate of two and a half to two and three quarters percent on average for 2007. In 2006, the economy grew oh, a little over three percent. And the slowdown in 2006, which is masked by the overall GDP growth number, showed up in uh, second quarter growth of around two and a half percent, two percent in the third quarter, and a very slow first part of the fourth quarter. The motive force, the reason for it, was a major slide in residential construction, a huge and quick and pronounced recession in home sales, housing starts, and residential construction. The whole residential real estate business of the United States essentially tumbled between the end of 2005 and the end of 2006. Our Federal Reserve describes it as a cooling. First, the gradual cooling of housing, and more recently in their statement, a cooling. So no, it's not a cooling. It was literally a collapse. Home sales and housing starts fell almost 30% from the end of 2005 to late this past summer. Home prices, not in the public indices, tumbled. Appraisal values went way down. The home building industry, in terms of housing starts, ground to a stop. Public starts fell from 2.5 million starts to about 1.5 million starts. It's about a 40% decline. And supply companies and industries in the home building housing were hurt very badly. The U.S. economy downshifted in a major way, levered by the slack of housing and residential construction. At the same time, Motor vehicle sales eased off, flat, and the auto industry, the U.S. auto industry, cut back on production jobs, and that sort of weakened the economy as well. In some areas of manufacturing, and in some areas of consumption related to housing and we saw quite a bit of weakness. And what is described seems to have stabilized the lower levels of activity about two or three months ago and as we exited the year the slide home sales and housing starts seem to have stopped and some key forward looking indicators of housing activity mortgage applications builders sentiment expectations consumer sentiment in terms of buying a house has picked up and it does seem as if the worst is over in this area of activity in this economy. Now, as far as we can see in data, and I think other analysts and observers have the same view, the trouble in housing and in autos did not have a seem to spread anywhere else. It's as if the U.S. economy suffered 
if we if we look at the economy as a patient, uh, the patient came to my office. I'm a doctor. I am a doctor, doctor. So I came to my office. I had a huge wound in the leg, and and the, the huge wound that was affected. It was right around the edges, uh, but the whole leg was not affected, and the whole body was not affected. Well, the analogy here is the housing construction is the wound, and the redness and spilling over and the edges, some of the collateral areas of spending and of production that feed right into construction and housing, but the rest of it intact. Now, historically, declines in housing and residential construction have been early indicators of a full-fledged recession. And so in the United States, the watch has been on. And indeed, our fixed income market has been expecting a full-fledged recession. And that still is a risk. The patients won't. It's not yet healed. It looks like the worst is over. But we can't be sure because there are second round effects from that collapse in housing activity that could bring <coughs> problems in consumption and in turn bring the economy down to a very weak state. Those second round effects on our research have to do with falling home prices. And the way that in the United States, residential real estate has been used over the years, recent years, to fund other areas of activity, particularly consumer spending. The tapping of previously untapped equity real estate to the use of new kinds of mortgage financing instruments is part of what I'm referring to. And of course, the long period of very low interest rates in the United States, artificially low interest rates, which made the money borrowed on real estate essentially free, irresistible to borrow and use, lettered by the aspect of collateral real estate. All of this was a major force in raising U.S. consumer spending far above its trend growth path. And as part of how the U.S. economy managed to lift the rest of the world economies through the bootstraps of the American consumer. Well, now with home prices falling in the published indices almost flat against a year ago and some of them negative, we're expecting U.S. home prices to show up as a down by the percent of year, show up that way the next three to six months. The potential effects of that on the asset value of real estate collateral, loans outstanding, the difficulty of raising more funds for American homeowners to use for purposes other than housing, capital losses on real estate, and a negative wealth effect because household wealth from real estate is going down. All of that carries a risk, a second round risk to the economy, which has yet to play out one way or the other. At this point, we are not seeing any significant second round risk from the collapse in housing activity that went on before 2006. The spending side of it, sales, starts, and we think residential construction, which lags sales and starts. The spending side probably won't go up, but won't go down so much in the first half of this year. And we'll just have to see whether the financial effects are significant or not. Certainly they were very significant in the housing boom, some people call it a bubble that we had, uh, but it doesn't have to be as harmful as the boom has turned to a home builder's bust as it was helpful during the home building boom. There are forces, I think, uh, that will not make it as uh, much of a problem as it was to be help in the housing boom. Uh, in any case, the data are suggesting that we have gone through the worst of this uh, negative impact from residential construction. It may well not be a correction of the excessive housing boom and bubble-like activity that we had in the United States. Residential construction and housing will not be active or an active generator of growth in the economy in the future. Neither will the finance front, but there is sufficiently strong 
growth in jobs, a sufficiently low unemployment rate, strong enough corporate sector spending and capital investment, strong exports, part of the world export boom that is going on, uh, and generally outside of housing, strong consumption carried the U.S. expansion into and through 2007 and well into 2008. That's the basic view that we have. And this is the basic story behind the U.S. slowdown in growth. Now we pick up to get to a two and a half, two and three quarters percent range of growth on average for 2007. The major risk to that view on the U.S. economy is probably more downside risk having to do with what we have still another down leg on real estate activity and will those falling home prices cause bad trouble for consumers and lenders in turn cause business to cut back hiring to stop the unemployment rate to rise and a full pledge the recession. That is a downside scenario and risk. And we give that one maybe one chance in four. And then there is another risk. It would be that we might have a better result, that the U.S. residential recession will turn out to be a lot like the one that occurred in the United Kingdom, where for a while the U.K. economy softened Housing fell, prices went down, uh, but that passed. And now the UK economy and inflation and home prices are often running again. Uh, the risk of being wrong here, in my view, is more likely that the US economy will do better than worse. Uh, and why do I say that? Our Federal Reserve has kept interest rates stable. There are ample funds available for housing and for other activities. This is not what normally occurs when we have a residential housing <coughs> recession. Typically, in most business cycle episodes, where we have gone to a full-fledged recession, interest rates have continued to rise. The availability of credit has tightened. Housing goes down. It affects the economy. But other areas of the economy, including business spending, go down too because of the generic and general effects of rising interest rates and the restraint in the availability of funds. Uh, by stopping the hikes in interest rates last summer, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve probably aborted and prevented the cumulative downturn that might otherwise have occurred. And of course, the funds available in the United States cash-rich corporations, lots of funds in financial institutions, even more funds in non-bank financial intermediaries, the new wave of pools of money, not in banks, but being deployed around the world for all the opportunities that globalization offers. That is really a very dynamic, powerful force, which makes me think that of the various choices for 2007, if wrong on the basic forecast, it could be more active rather than less active. In any case, the U.S. growth rate at two and a half to two and three quarters, or even three, or it's a little lower than that, somewhere in that range, is a lot less than the growth rate of recent years, which ran three to four percent. And a good deal less than most regions of the world, including Asia, the Eurozone, the U.K., and most of what we have called the emerging world. Less than Canada. Less than Australia New Zealand. The U.S., for the first time in years, is probably going to lag in growth compared to all the other, almost all the other regions in the world. And number one this year for uh, non-U.S. economies and regions, of course, as was the case last year, is Asia and the Asia Pacific. Led by dynamic growth in China, we're marking nine and a half to ten percent for China. India, eight and a half, eight to nine percent. Japan, uh, almost three percent. Japan is now part of the dynamic up movement in the Asian area, growing faster than trend. 
with an unemployment rate for Japanese say is at full employment. Of course, the unemployment rate here in South Korea is not all that high anymore either. I think your last figure was 3%. Uh, and uh, that's probably not full employment. I remember when it was much lower than that. The 3% is, I think, the lowest unemployment rate in South Korea in a long time. In fact, around the world, what we are seeing is, even in the Arizona, declining unemployment rates as more and more people find and create jobs. Business around the world, corporations, is not hiring so actively, but the people, individuals, in the new world, the new world of the internet, the new world of small companies, opening up anywhere, individuals, small companies, able to sell products anywhere around the world, to ship products anywhere around the world, to create production anywhere around the world, not quite anywhere around the world, but in most places around the world, is creating a tremendous amount of energy in the U.S. and the global economic system, which I think is showing up after a long time to lower unemployment rates. The lower unemployment rates that we systematically see almost everywhere in the world also tell us that these global pools of labor that have shown up because of globalization and the ability to hire and produce anywhere in the world are being absorbed by an actively growing world economy. That in turn tells me that workers around the world, particularly those who are educated and in the service-oriented areas that are in such demand all over the world, are going to earn very good money, turn up money to spend, and that is a pillar of support for global expansion. It is also a likely source of higher inflation coming from the cost push side as companies try to pass on these costs in the form of higher prices. <coughs> Part of the view that over the long term, inflation will continue on average to rise higher. Part of the view uh, that we will continue to have uh, rising inflation. Inflation rates are, are fairly low around the world, but uh, over time, uh, I think they're going to get higher. Uh, well, for South Korea, uh, we have a conventional estimate. Four to five percent. Looks like South Korean growth is five percent. Uh, and estimate for the fourth quarter for the year of 2006. And we are in the four and a half percent range for 2007. Sustained expansion here. And part of the global and Asia Pacific trade uh, framework, which is so active in terms of exports and imports and technology. But of course, a much more and intensely competitive world. South Korean companies uh, on both the goods and the services side. Now, the wave of demand and uh, uh, growth in countries like China and India, particularly as consumers begin to spend more money and look outward, is a healthy dynamic for growth in this area. I think the second area that I have to point to is the Eurozone. For years, uh, decades, on average, growing much more slowly than the United States. The Eurozone growth in 2006 about two and three quarters percent. <coughs> U.S. economic growth in 2006, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, is going to be below that number. Was and is below that number. The Eurozone is actually growing faster than the United States. Uh, and uh, though there will be some hesitation in growth in Germany because of an increase in taxes, uh, Eurozone growth of two and a half to three percent above trend is our view for 2007. Uh, in part, the Eurozone, which is now 13 countries, and the uh, Union is 27 countries, European uh, Economic Union is 27 countries, is benefiting from a, a boom in what used to be called the, the Eastern Europe, uh, the new uh, emerging Europe countries uh, that are uh, growing very rapidly trading combined from Germany uh, and uh, contributing much to the uh, European economy. Northern and Southern Europe, as strong as uh, those countries have been for quite some time, uh, Germany and France are actually still lagging, and Italy also, in part because of the good nature of the Italian economy suffering. 
and competition, basic uh, items of competition to China. Uh, emerging Latin America uh, as well uh, looks strong to us. Latin America, 4.5 to 5% growth in 2007. Uh, that's quite uh, solid. Uh, and uh, the uh, United Kingdom and Canada are also growing faster than uh, the uh, United States. So, sustained expansion worldwide, uh, our uh, number, we cover 45 countries, is in the three and a half, three and a quarter, three and a half percent range. This year it was uh, three and three quarters percent. So global growth slows down some, that's because of the U.S. Uh, U.S. holds on average to the slower growth that it fell to during 2006, and the rest of the world holds now many of the regions of the world, the growth advantage that emerged during 2006. Over time, if these growth differences are maintained, trade imbalances, particularly if the dollar should on average go down, the huge trade imbalances that are part of global imbalances should uh, begin to redress itself. We do think that process is in Trained now, it has started. Uh, we're going to see these uh, growth trends continue now for several years. Let me turn to uh, interest rates and then to the currency and leave some time for uh, questions. Uh, on central banks, uh, we think on average short term interest rates generally will rise. It's a view that grows out of the view of the U.S. and global economies and continuing expansion. Uh, and the desire of central banks to keep inflation in price-stable territory. Almost all the central banks of the world uh, have price stability as their major goal. As you know, in the United States, we have a dual mandate of price stability and maximum sustainable growth. Uh, there's also a third part to that called moderate long-term interest rates, but that follows from the first two of the first two are achieved. <laughs> Central banks around the world, as a year ago, are in different stages of dealing with uh, the price stability issue. In the case of Japan, for example, uh, there is no issue in price stability. Inflation on the preferred measure of the Bank of Japan is very, very low. It's, it's the CPI express food which now stands at two-tenths year over year. There's hardly any inflation in their preferred measure existing. The Bank of Japan is in the process of normalizing, much as the U.S. Uh, has already done, completed, interest rates back to what is normal for an economy that is in reasonably good shape. Uh, we expect the Bank of Japan to continue the process as the data permit it uh, during 2007. Uh, last year, uh, the Bank of Japan raised rates one time to 25 basis points from zero. Uh, we're expecting a 25 basis point increase at the January 17-18 uh, Bank of Japan meeting. Another one in late spring and perhaps one more this year if there key inflation indicator continues to rise as we are forecasting. And that would take the Japanese call money rate to about 1% late this year and the 10-year JGB yield to somewhere around 2%. Uh, you know, those interest rates are absolutely not punitive at all. There's no way that interest rates at those levels in Japan will do anything but worry the financial markets for a short period of time in terms of their potential negative effect. The Japanese economy is solid. The business profits are strong. Consumers are starting to spend more on average. The unemployment rate is low. Japanese consumers are optimistic. Uh, those interest rates are not going to interfere with anything. But we expect China will raise interest rates some this year to deal with some uh, inflation. We've seen the Bank of China uh, raise reserve requirements several times and we uh, would not be surprised if the Bank of Korea raised interest rates another time or two given the concern about uh, real estate prices that exist 
it's not really an inflation problem here in South Korea that we can see, but we respect the views of the, the Bank of Korea uh, on this issue. Uh, that probably don't fully agree with rate hikes, but as part of what central banks do in terms of keeping price inflation under control, some more interest rate hikes are probably coming. In the uh, uh, Eurozone, certainly the European Central Bank will raise rates at least two more times, maybe three, uh, as Jean-Claude Trichet and his colleagues uh, work to hold price inflation low. And in the United States, where interest rates are on hold, federal funds rate at five and a quarter percent, we think that rate will stay there for almost all of this year. The risk of recession in the United States does appear to be diminishing. Core inflation on the major indicator of the Federal Reserve is coming down, but slowly. And at the Federal Reserve, we have some members who will not be satisfied, not be ready to cut rates, to reduce interest rates until core inflation is somewhere around a point and a half. It's over 2% now. That's in the middle of the 1% to 2% range uh, that uh, we think they, uh, they, they watch. And in addition, for reasons of credibility of the U.S. Central Bank, uh, these members of the Federal Reserve, they are at least Mr. Moscow, Mr. Uh, uh, Lacker, uh, and uh, Charles Plosser, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, probably some others. Mr. Cohn talked, gave a talk uh, earlier today at U.S. time. Uh, they're uh, not at all in the mood, nor have they suggested to us in their public comments that they're going to cut rates and they don't really think the U.S. is going to have recession. And we don't think the U.S. is going to have recession either. So they're not going to cut rates. And those on the Federal Reserve who might want to reduce interest rates to make sure the economy grows close to its potential aren't really going to do that as long as core inflation is over the upper bound, the bound of 2%. And that includes Janet Yellen, perhaps the chairman himself, Mr. Bernanke. In other words, on the scenario we have, and the consensus has in the United States where the U.S. growth rate, which touched down to a lower level in 2006, thanks to the housing recession, comes back up to two and a quarter, two and a half, three, somewhere in that range, and core inflation comes down but stays sticky. There's no reason to cut rates. There's no reason to raise rates. And so the expectation for the U.S. Central Bank is they simply sit there at five and a quarter percent for virtually all of the year, and if there's any change, it's just going to be a fine-tuning change, a little bit down, a little bit up. And of the choices, I would say a little bit up, not a little bit down. For well, long-term rates in the United States aren't likely to change very much on a scenario of growth, two and a half, two and three quarters percent, core inflation a little lower, and a stable federal funds rate. Ten-year Treasury yields probably will range from four and a half to five percent interest rate stable in the U.S. And that said, the U.S. can continue to sustain its expansion and to provide from the consumer side support to the rest of the world. The rest of the world sustain expansion as well. It looks like a pretty good year. Higher rates from many central banks around the world, but not high enough to punish any economies a lot, to interfere with growth, and not high enough to cause the availability of funds to diminish powerful funding that is now going on around the world. A lot of non-bank financial intermediaries fuel economic growth. Well, uh, this picture of sustained growth means good profits growth, although diminishing in the U.S., good profits growth in other countries of the world. The interest rates not rising to interfere with valuations, and stocks around the world should have a good year. For the U.S., we are roughly marking uh, our expectation of the Dow Jones and S&P 500 as up 10%, uh, not necessarily right away, 10% over the course of the next six to nine months. We put the S&P 500 at 1550, 
and the Dow Jones approaching 14,000. Asian stock markets, most of them had a wonderful year in 2006. South Korea stock market did not. Uh, but uh, Asian markets, particularly emerging Asian markets, had a wonderful year, and we think we'll see more of the same, not the same returns as last year. And we are overweighted as we have been uh, in the Japanese stock market, as the Japanese economy continues to do uh, better. Stock markets around the world, we think we'll enjoy a very good year. Uh, it would take uh, much more than the slowdown that has occurred in the United States. It would take trouble outside the United States to think to interfere with the global growth scenario that I've outlined and turn into trouble for uh, stock markets uh, around the, the uh, world. Uh, the world, with the changing economic geography that I have alluded to, the world economy is not going to be driven by the U.S. economy the way it used to be, unless whatever it is that might cause the U.S. economy to turn down is generic to the rest of the world. That is, if inflation goes very high all over the world, perhaps because oil prices, hypothetically, might go to $100 a barrel, and central banks around the world raise interest rates then the world economy will tumble. But the world economy is not going to fall on a housing and residential construction recession that is local to the United States. Indeed, other real estate markets will probably benefit because the money that would be invested in U.S. real estate will go somewhere else. It has to be generic to all of them. Finally, the dollar, the view on the dollar remains as it has been for us. It is that on average, looking at the fundamentals of relative growth, relative interest rates, and at the longer run, uh, political and geopolitical factors uh, that affect uh, the currencies, as well as the changing role and importance of countries and their currencies around the world. Uh, we can only, at the moment, think that on average the dollar will go down. But it did go down and reached our targets against the euro last year and against the pound sterling. It did go down very much against Asia. It did go down against the Chinese currency uh, and it uh, went uh, down against the uh, Korean uh, currency. Uh, it was, was it over a thousand last year when I was here? One to the dollar. Uh, it lately, the one is going up against the dollar. We would expect uh, the dollar to be down on average against major currencies 5 to 10 percent over this year. We regard that as orderly. Uh, we are targeting on the dollar euro and expecting 145 or so, six to nine months down the road. Dollar yen, uh, 105 to 110, six to nine months down the road. Uh, we continue to think. Chinese currency will appreciate but very, very slowly despite the efforts of Treasury Secretary Paulson and the complaints of Congress, that will still be a slow appreciation. And the uh, other currencies of Asia should appreciate some against the dollar this year. But the movements of the currencies should be quarterly and not call into play any major shifts in policy, nor interfere with the flows of trade and commerce. Uh, during this, uh, during this uh, year, at least uh, on average. Finally, uh, the U.S. political situation has an uncertainty. We are getting a flurry of actions from the new Democratic Congress. They are positive. Uh, we've gotten some teeth in uh, some of the uh, ethics uh, and so-called earmark legislation that goes on in our Congress. The House has passed Hagel legislation, which requires uh, budget balancing mechanisms to come into play if spending goes up or taxes are cut, and we will see a flurry of uh, attempts uh, to get things done here in the first two to four weeks of the new Congress. Subsequent to that, our expectation is presidential politics of 2008 will take over, and very little will happen in the U.S. as a whole host of candidates come out of the woodwork 
for 2008. Four, six, eight candidates probably from each party. It's too early to handicap what's going to happen in 2008. And so for the markets and for U.S. policies and progress or lack thereof on them, uh, our view is there will be almost no progress on any significant policies in the United States until after the election in 2008. And then we may see major shifts in policies because the problems, international and domestic, that have piled up that will face the next president and Congress of the United States are so immense in a rapidly changing global economy. It's so immense that the U.S. will then turn very much inward to deal with those problems post-2008. This view is one of the reasons why we think the dollar uh, will be gradually edged out of portfolios and why we think that relative proportions of currency portfolios central banks and investors around the world will gradually shift to a uh, euro position to an Asian centric position uh, why there will still be good demand for gold and dollar alternatives uh, it will be political uncertainty around the U.S. and on a long run basis expanding the position of the U.S. in this rapidly changing global economy uh, with the seismic shifts uh, there are only some of them that I have described well thank you very much again for your